Wait for it, wait for it, and we're live. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just a couple of nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. Uh, so let's get into this. But first, first, I got to say, Nick, we really got to update that uh, that intro because now it's not just a couple of nerdy veterans. We've got Stabby. Oh, yeah. We're going to have to rewrite that. Okay. <laughs> we're going to have to rewrite that. I, I, we cannot call her a dependent, though. She will cut me. She told me so. No, she'll cut me, then cut you. I still get in trouble. This is true. This is true. See, this is what you get for saving my life, man. It's like yeah. an obligation or something. All right. Got straight and narrow, bro. Yeah, that's right. You got it. All right. But before we do that, we are doing this in conjunction with Upstream Review. So let me show their little glorious intro. That was too cool not to share. Uh, as you, many of you know, I do. Uh, I write uh, book reviews for Upstream Reviews. And so now that we're doing movie reviews, they gloriously share them. Uh, and it's always fun to get people to see what we're doing. So it works so well with our other movie reviews. Got us eyeballs, which is always a good thing. Uh, as long as they stay in their head and not in our hands, because uh, that gets messy. It's a thing. That's uh, a whole other episode. Yeah, I mean, we did do horror. So I don't know if, like, truly gory horror is its own thing. Maybe we should we should look no, into that. It is October. Scanners. We could do scanners for scientific horror. What is that? That one may be not safe for work, though. Okay, well, we don't want any NSFW, so we're just going to move on. And first, I'm going to say we're going to let our lovely guest introduce themselves. So we're going to start with the ladies first because we are gentlemen-ish. And the ish is doing a lot of heavy lifting. But uh, Ashley, can you introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers? Hi, everybody at Blasters and uh, our podcast. Um I'm Ashley R. Pollard. I write as Ashley R. Pollard. Everybody just knows me as Ashley. Um, I'm a long-time science fiction fan. I'm really old. I think I'm the oldest person on this podcast today. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm also a martial artist, though I haven't practiced much in the last few years because of, well, stuff. Um uh, Aikido, Eido, and archery. Uh, I don't do Kyo, though, because there's no club that can teach that, but I do conventional longbow archery. I also play role-playing games, yeah, uh, war games. I've written a set of rules many, many years ago that nobody has ever heard of called Onmu War Machine, which stands for Oversized Heavy mechanized units don't look for it you'll never find it and i write science fiction and uh, cosmic horror that's me all righty and uh before we let michael introduce himself madam we are the blasters and blaze podcast so i do have to uh to do the religion question are you ready for this oh, never but go ahead all right star wars star trek or firefly Oh, that's so cruel. I, it would have to be Star Trek. But, you know, I love Firefly and I love the original Star Wars. But Star Trek came first. You have to understand, you know, I'm old. You know, I go back in the mists of time, like the city at the edge of forever. And she's like know, the great mothers of Dothmere. That's right. Uh, so <laughs> Star Trek, you know. If you'd said Doctor Who, I'd have to have said Doctor Who because that was the very first science fiction uh, TV series I ever got into. But so it'd be Star Trek. Okay, you know, well, be... next, aren't you? Okay, so uh, I actually jokingly said you. It's funny that you said that because when I write about uh, when I write my newsletters, I often include stories from when I was in the army because my uh, newsletter followers love those. Uh, and I always preface it that this is way back when dinosaurs roamed the earth because, you know, uh, there's this funny meme going around that says, you know, the type of uh, infantry grunt you are based on the uniform that was in when you enlisted. And so it's got like great grandpa and it's got the old olive drab that was Vietnam. And then it got the woodland camis with the grandpa grunt and then whatever the hell they call the new stuff. Because, uh, you know, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, 
Ortiz was a was a soldier too, and so uh, I jokingly called myself Grandpa Grant, and I signed my uh, <laughs> that in my newsletter when I tell those stories because the way it was when we were in is just not the way it is today. And let's not get started on Alice versus whatever Molly. versus whatever yeah. because you know that's just a whole battle rattle. Holocaust. I remember uh, Nick and I talked about this before, but I remember when they changed the way we taught close quarter combat because of the technology. So when Nick and I went through, and Mike, I think you as well, they still taught you to shoot with us for your standing shooting with a side profile because it made you a smaller target because you didn't have flag jacket. And then the minute the uh, bulletproof vest got to be more common, they ended up teaching you to shoot with your chest forward, which is a lot harder to do. You had to relearn. I mean, that was, we're talking hundreds of hours of muscle memory training to make that movement work because it is so awkward. It's like yeah. a turtle shuffling forward after it's got to use the bathroom or something. It's kind of, how I would describe it. But I, I remember all those changes that the gear made in how you operated. Oh, you were and then, always taught to breach with the chest first, as in like that's the target to present. And I don't know if that had changed or whatever. That that was when we taught to present, when we did breaching drills before, because I went to basic in 98, uh, none of the breaching drills cover chest forward because you wanted a smaller target. You want to make it harder. So it was the side profile was everything. And then you did a lot of sidestepping and almost like the side straddle hop approach to moving around. You remember those days, Nick? I do. And then, so that was, was that a, a Ranger contract? So I was mostly in trade doc. And then I got, I went through RIP at the time. It's now RASP. Graduated from there, went to Ranger Battalion. That's when they were already starting to present the chest as the target for your shooting. And I did that for a couple of years. And then they were like, hey, let's send you to sniper school. And I'm like, all right, cool. That sounds fun. And then I had to go back to learning how to shoot like this. Yeah, it was, it was definitely an evolution in um, how we do things. So uh, it was, it was, it's interesting. I try to factor that in when I write mill sci-fi and stuff. It's like, well, what's their equipment? Because that's going to affect how they maneuver. Um, and everyone just, you know, most people write mill sci-fi with, oh, well, they've got power armor. But Colonial Marines were a thing too, right? And so it just it depends on how you set up their equipment and where their weak points are because that's what you're going to want to minimize access to. So, all right, we are polytheistic over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. So, madam, Game of Thrones, The Wheel of Time, or Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings, hands down. How dare you? Get out of here. Wash your Did mouth you out ask of somebody from the UK <laughs> not to pick Tolkien? Well, we haven't sat down and had our great conference where we drink our coffee with our pinkies out and we discuss what we're going to replace the, uh, the, sci or the fantasy religion question with <laughs> because... Uh, everybody, uh, wherever they are from, always so cites the OG of J.R. Tolkien. So how do you not? But, I mean, he's so iconic. I don't know. It's, it's a balancing. We almost have to have, like, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, or the Samarillion for people to choose on the Tolkien question and then give them another fantasy option because it's almost no. unfair to put people against him. You're missing the main man in America, and it's not – George R. R. Martin, or even what's his name? He wrote Wheel of Time. I've forgotten his name. Robert before. Jordan. That's right. Um, it's Robert E. Howard or Fritz Leiber. Sorry. I mean, you guys are just so young. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also a huge Conan fan, too, sir. So. All right. I'm going to have to write those down. And uh, it's nice to be called young because my son thinks I'm ancient. Um, I've, I've told this story before, but when they were doing the about a, uh, 2017, they were doing the 100 year anniversary of something with World War One, and he asked me if I knew those people, and I'm like, I had to pause the screen, and I showed him the picture of the guy in the the World War One, you know, wool uniform, and then me when I was in uniform, and it was definitely not wool, uh, and I'm like, see, the uniforms aren't even different. This was 100 years ago, kid. How old do you think I am? And then, of course, he really killed me and he like stabbed the wound and twisted the knife a little bit. He goes, That's not you, daddy. That's half of you. <laughs> and now the kid doesn't get to eat because, you know, life lesson. Oh, man. Caden asked if we, when I was a kid, when I got my first car, if I had to crank the engine first. I can beat you all. Go he on. Asked me that. Kaden asked me um, if 
I was alive when there was black and white TV. I said, I remember black and white TVs mainly because my grandparents had one. And he goes, so was the world in black and white too? That's just because he's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, what, what, yeah, because I, like around well, 1972, the world just exploded with color. They said, let's just explode color. it with color. <laughs> dark gray and black world. All right, madam, we have one last uh, religion question because we are not knuckle dragging troglodytes. We're recovering infantrymen now. Uh, so, coffee or tea, and how do you take it? Although I kind of think I know, given you're British. Well, that's a good question. You see, tea in the morning. And it's black with no milk. You know, don't have bovine secretions in my tea. Thank you very much. Uh, but the rest of the day, it'll be coffee. Uh, we do um, cafetiers, which is like press coffee you know, okay. and, and stuff. And it's really nice. So okay. you know, uh, I, I'm uh, bilingual is not the word I'm looking for, but um, by drinking, you know, whatever. <laughs> you're, you're caffeine fluid. Yeah, ab yeah, absolutely. Caffeine yeah, fluid. Yeah, I right. love it. Uh, first, uh, Ortiz, Michael, uh, he pro publishes as MD, so that's why he's got that on the screen, uh, because apparently his name is so common that um, he's on page 27 of a Google search of his name. Um, but he's number one in our hearts. Um, but, uh, but Michael, so how do you take your tea or your coffee? I don't, I don't drink coffee. <gasps> How did you survive the army? We discussed Not this. Not why you last had to get out. We discussed yeah, this like, last time. Bye. I, I, would it, I would trade it away. I was. Yeah. Not, we, 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 but just, I think I'll we, just take my coffee and go. Literally, we discussed this. It was the fact that, like, I was I was young, and so it didn't matter. Caffeine was not a requirement. I just I just did it. Um, now, it's a lot more energy drinks than it is anything, but. At the time, it, it I was unaffected. I would be like, "All right, whatever." Three hours of sleep, let's go. I'm great. You know, definitely, definitely yeah. fell asleep once on Firewatch. I have no I, memory of the Firewatch. Like, started it, and then some guy was like, "Hey, I'm relieving you," and I was like, "What happened? What, did I just?" Walk <laughs> um, but yeah, like I just it wasn't a thing. Um, I'll do like a shot of espresso occasionally and like a chai. Um, but and then uh, in high school, I worked in a kitchen, and because I was an idiot and just destroying myself. I, I did drink coffee, but I would pour like two packets of hot cocoa into it and then drink that. That uh, sounds good. Oh, it, it was good, but it also, I think I gained 20 pounds that summer. I could believe it. Yeah, because you asked like a 16-year-old kid, like, how many burgers you want for lunch? And I'd be like, I don't know, give me 12. And they're like, cool, that's not even a question. Here you go. <laughs> give me all the burgers you have. <laughs> but, wow. Uh, but yeah. So I'm guessing you didn't do the Folgers dip in your in your gums from the MREs either. No, nope. I thought that was no, disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. It was, but it worked. Um, and yeah, like there was always something somebody did, you know, would get would give me for their for coffee. So I was like, yeah, this is currency to me. So I just traded it away. I did that with the little Tabasco sauce that came in the MREs. Yep. Would never use that, so I'd trade that away. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I get it. It's it's funny now. A really good friend of mine was in the Marine Corps until recently, and he'd come back from like being on base and stuff, and always give us MREs because we were living in Cali at the time and figured we'd need it for maybe a, a earthquake stuff. And uh, I would have to laugh because my my wife would just rip them open and take all the coffees out because she loved them. And then and then and then she's like, "What did you call this?" And I was like, "You're rat fucking the MRE." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so she would just always be like, "Okay, well, I'm just gonna go do this to all of them." Then I was like, "No, no, you're a terrible you person. Don't, don't do that." <laughs> I mean, I had to do nope that for like skin problems, but you know, because you take stuff out to like minimize size in your rucksack. So I'm like, okay, I don't really need the gum or this or whatever. And then I put it back, roll it really tight, and then put our monitor tape over it. But I did it in such a way where I couldn't see what hell MRE it was. So could be egg omelet. Who knows? Could be tuna casserole. Gross. Or it could be the four fingers of death. Yeah, I was lucky I missed the vomit comment with the uh, omelet MREs. Those came after I got out. I heard horror stories. Uh, actually, yeah. oh, They were in. When I was there, they were in a, a very dark brown packaging. Not that like tan color. I don't like, remember so ever getting those. Dark text. This is like ninety six. So, okay. Yeah, Grandpa Grunt, and the the type would be so dark that it would blend in with the 
the brown, the dark brown, you, you, every meal was a surprise. Okay. I just don't remember ever getting those. Maybe I just lucked out or I blacked out the memory because it was so awful. It's probably a, you blocked it. Yeah. There's every actually a line. A surprise for Nick anyway. Yeah, that's one of the things you talk about rat fucking the MREs. There's actually uh, one of the guys that was uh, famous during our time, um, Fitzy Mess, and um, um, uh, what was the guy's name? He did the um, EOD song, IED. Oh, what was it? Um, yeah, that was one of his lines in there about, about rat fucking the MREs and how they had to beat this guy up because he would steal everyone's shit. And now I'm yeah. blanking, blanking on the name. I'll remember it as soon as we hit stop recording, and I'll throw it in the show notes, people. Uh, but he he was uh, infamous for the uh, commandant knowing who he was and telling him to stop making music. He didn't listen. <laughs> I, I figure if you're a Marine and the commandant knows your name is a Lance Corporal, you're doing something right, in my opinion. <laughs> there was two. There was that one. There was Fitzy Mess, um, the guy that did the um, Haji Girl song, and uh, and this guy. And I'm drawing a blank on his name. Oh, crap. Anyway, we're not here to talk about memories of times overseas and deserts far, far away. So instead, we're going to dive into this uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the movie that we're here to review. So this is yet another retro review. Uh, we're talking about Black Hole, which was made in 1979. It's an American science fiction film directed by Gary Nielsen. Nelson? Nelson, uh, I shouldn't write that um, so sloppy. Uh, produced by Walt Disney Productions, and it was... Um, a favorite of Michael Ortiz when we asked him what movies he wanted to review. So we set this up and when we wrote the, uh, or shared the forbidden planet review, Ashley was such a fan. We said, Hey, do you want to come on when we do this movie too? And she was Nelson. like totally down. Nelson. Thank you. Nelson. Um, I really should write neater. One of these days I'll get on that. That's what you have me for. If you start writing neater, then I don't have anything to look up. <laughs> Well, your job is to, to just be there and like stab people. So, I mean, you're you're o for o, like one for one. I don't you know. know what? Mm -hmm. You're asking mm -hmm. it for it because like everybody else is like into the afternoon, and I just rolled out of bed. So. <laughs> and beautiful as always, me. Absolutely. No, no, I'm not, and I know it, and I'm okay with it. I said you. I told you guys, now. you get. <laughs> I I warned you guys you were getting stabby light today. That's it's okay. Make the alternate no action hair. figure, hot mess stabby. Mm -hmm. When you start making action figures, like, oh, here's ready for the show stabby, and here's hot mess stabby. Dude, it's been cold all week here, and I've been in love with it. And then last night and this morning, it decided it's going to be 80 degrees out here, and all the flowers are going to bloom, and my allergies are not having it. They are not having it. It is absolutely okay. So what we're going to do with this movie review, like all of them, we're going to look at the blurb. We're going to talk about the movie trailer, the characters, the plot, the world building. And because it's a movie, the cinematography, and we're going to pretend like we're like sophisticated and stuff. We'll look at the movie poster and we'll talk about our overall thoughts on this uh, on this film. So for summary, it's The Black Hole, which was uh, directed by Gary Nielsen. Nelson. Excuse me. You can buy it on the Amazons and it's for $6.99 US. Um, it is available for free on YouTube if you want to watch commercials with it. Uh, the film is 98 minutes. It was released in the UK first on December 18th, 1979. Uh, and then it was released in the US on December 21st, 1979. Uh, I couldn't find any copy for it. I just found the trailer and that was pretty much it. Um, that's I'm finding out to be a lot of, a lot more common with some of the older movies. The, uh, the ad copy didn't survive. What you end up seeing mostly is the modern reviews of it. Mm. So for whatever that's worth. And... Um, with that being said, we're going to show the movie trailer and we're going to talk about it. So, uh, as usual, I do not own this. This is copyrighted. I will link all the da data, so please don't copyright strike us, but let's roll that footage. There is an inexorable force in the cosmos where time and space converge. A place beyond man's vision, but not his reach. It is the most mysterious and awesome point in the universe. Where the here and now may be forever. On my ship, you ask. Oh. 
it is unavoidable. Moving through space, swallowing everything in its path, radio waves, light. Are you programmed to speak? Even planets and stars. Man is headed straight for the black hole. What'll we do? We wait. All right, I forgot that um, those movie trailers were so long back in the day. I don't think we have the attention span for such longer trailers anymore. I blame TikTok. I do. Um, so uh, Stabby just pointed out in the comment section that it's also available for viewing on Disney Plus if you wanted to stream it. Um, so that's that's good to know for people who want to watch it. Um, so it is not quite in public domain yet, I don't think. No, it was in 1979. It's got a few. So. Years. Um, cause they're, they're for public domain stuff. There's the archive website, which you can get a lot of old movies cause forbidden planet is in the archives for free cause it's in public domain. Uh, but this one is not. So there's lots of ways to find it. Um, so what did you guys think of the trailer? Did it make you want to watch the movie? Uh, in 1979, I think I would have caught it. Yeah. What about you, Ashley? I actually saw it in the cinema in 1979. I told you I was the oldest person on this podcast, and I wasn't a kid either. I was, you know, a full-grown-ass adult. Um, let me say, first off, that, that, that trailer is probably as exciting as it gets. Uh, that was actually pretty exciting. Uh, you can see the roughness of, um, or lack of sophistication, perhaps is a better word, uh, of uh, the story, uh, but it. My my biggest feeling from the first time of watching it, and I have watched it more than once, was the first time was just disappointment. It it had so much promise. The trailer for 1979 was really, oh yeah, this is exciting. You've got you know, staff and staff and the Cygnus is gorgeous spaceship. Um, unfortunately, it's a bit of a curate's egg, but, um, yeah, I'll probably save more comments for later. Do you, do you think that was because, like, two years prior, you had the trailer for Star Wars, which was a lot better than this one, but, like, Star Wars had just came out. I, do you think that kind of, like, jaded some people or that 
increased our expectations of like what science fiction cinema was going to be. Yeah. That's how I would have felt. But. Yeah. No. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm oh, sorry. I'm. I'm supposed to. I'm. I'm the one talking because I'm the old one who saw it back then. Look. I went into that cinema and I can remember sitting there in the dark and the, the images coming up and the sickness was gorgeous. And and then uh, the Palomino, which is the little ship that, are we spoiling too much? Well, that, that gets gets taken on board the Cygnus. It, 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 it was not as nice as the Cygnus. The Cygnus was really good. For 1979, that spaceship was stonking. I mean, it was just, it had all that kind of gribbly 2001 feel to it with yeah. kind of the Star Wars, sort of like, wow, and it's a black hole and stuff. And then and then you had the robots with the square, oh, cartoony eyes and, and you know, it's like, oh, I just want Vincent. to kill myself. Vincent. You know? Yeah, I love Vincent. So, what about you, uh, Michael? What do you think of the trailer? Did it, would it make you want to watch it? I mean, I think it would. I I think even now, if I had no idea what it was about, I'd at least be kind of curious because it seems to have this element blend between, like, you can see definitely a Star Wars kind of vibe, but then there is this mysteriousness to it, and like the tagline is great, honestly. Like the adventure oh, yeah. begins where everything ends, and you're like, that's a pretty cool tagline. Um, and it definitely feels like somewhere somebody was like, hey, did you see that thing we can do in a computer now? Yeah, we can make graphs and stuff. You put that in that trailer. Everyone needs to see. You spent money on that. Like, you show that in the trailer. <laughs> show it as much as you can. <laughs> um, yeah, and I know that, like, Disney uh, spent a lot of money on the effects for this and did, like, did, did develop, like, a whole new camera system for it and a bunch of really interesting engineering, um, which is part of why I think they hate it. Because they they spent all this money, they developed tech, and then that's what they produced. I actually thought that too. Like when I was watching it, some of the technology, especially doing some of the camera shots, I remember thinking, okay, now we know what inspired Blair Witch Project, but also how are they doing some of it with like the zero G stuff? Because um, it definitely made me wonder how they were doing that back then. Like it was definitely, it's, it's interesting. Well, I I uh, understand that they they had to have the woman with short hair, yes, because yes. Uh, it would give away what they were doing she had um, to cut her hair. with with the stuff. But in the shots where they're doing that, they're hanging them by their feet, and rather than the other way, so you're not looking you're not looking for the wires because makes sense. Yeah, they they yeah. hit. They did a lot of very clever stuff with the cinematography, and they spent all that uh, creativity on realizing the um, zero G effects, and then failed to put any of that creativity into the actual dialogue. Um, well, I think I think the movie suffers from actually Star Wars, not just like the quality of Star Wars or whatever. But I feel like it was a script that had been kicked around for a while. It got through rewrite after rewrite. It had sat around. They kind of were trying to figure out what to do. And then this movie came called Star Wars came out and made an oodle of money. And someone said, green like this, fast track it, get it done. And they're like, well, we're not really ready with this rewrite. And they said, I don't care. Like, you need, we need money. Like, we need to cash in on this Star Wars success. And by the way, you know how Star Wars had adorable droids? We're going to have adorable droids. You know how Star Wars had, like, guys in black armor? We're going to have guys in black armor. <laughs> Stormtroopers? We're going to have Stormtroopers. Um, and they said it just like that. <laughs> Well, of course. Yeah, but before that meeting happened, if there was a Zoom call back then, it probably would have gone something like this. Here's what I need. <laughs> All right. We got an attack. We got a protagonist. We're lost in space. We're going to take parts from Forbidden Planet. We're going to take parts from Star Wars. Yeah, you know, and then we're going to make a buttload of money. You know? Yeah, because as far as I right. understand, the movie was actually inspired by the Poseidon adventure. It was yeah. meant to be the Poseidon adventure in space. It's supposed and, to be a disaster film in space, and it became yeah. something else. And you can no, you can kind of faster. <laughs> like you can see it, but at the same time, yeah, you also see where it's someone like took a syringe of Star Wars and just like open wide. Yeah. 
So I actually yeah. think there was shades of Star Trek too in the way that clothing, like it was very polyester, Shatner esque in the uniform choices. I think that was um, also just very indicative of the era. I feel like I think so. Like, 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 especially if you. That's why I always find it interesting when I, if I watch like the original Star Wars and actually think about things, and you compare it to like Logan's Run or Barbarella or films that had come out in a similar era, and like sci-fi always had this very kind of silly look. And Star Wars just looked dramatically different, like just the the grime and the wear and the designs. And and so I, I think it just still fell into that category where it was like science fiction has to look this way. We have to have it be like the polyester uniforms. We have to have it be, I don't know, like geometrical everything. Um, like I loved Maximilian as a kid. I still like Maximilian, but he kind of a goofy looking murder robot. Like, <laughs> yeah. He's a very he, looks, he looks like he looks like some kids like some art director was like, "Hey, son, draw me a robot." And he's like, "I got a square and another square and a larger square, and he's got he's got spinny death blades." That's the rope. He's like, "Done. We're gonna make it real." <laughs> I actually thought one in one of my notes to myself was that some of the cinematography and some of just the effects overall was like an LSD fever dream. So I'm definitely seeing what you mentioned, Nick. Some of this trippy stuff is like. I don't know if this was just the hippie, like far out man, or, or they really were on drugs, or they just thought, you know, they were going to be different by being the same as everybody else in the era. Um, but it was definitely, you could see shades of that, um, which you're talking about with like how they designed things. It was so, I don't know how much of that was the tech just didn't support some of the sleeper lines, or how much of that was intentional, though. Um, I think a lot of it was due to lack of technology. Uh, like apparently Vincent was originally supposed to have more elaborate electronic eyes based on like electronic stock ticker type billboards, which would have been given him a greater range of facial expressions. The electromagnetic mechanical eyes didn't work properly and the effect was abandoned at the beginning of principal photography. So, oh, so it just looks like a cartoon character. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. I I'm, think here for my I'm sorry, go ahead. Stabby, you were speaking? I just said I'm here for it. Yeah. It's Disney's first PG rated movie, yes. though. Yes, that was a big deal. That was a huge deal. You could say F, you could say the F word twice in a PG. <laughs> just not in a sexual manner. Just not in a sexual manner. All right. So we, we've talked a little bit about the robots, but before we dive into that, we're going to look at this movie poster and then we're going to, I've got some clips I want to show. Um, so this is the actual movie poster. <laughs> from from the uh the original so you can see the uh this is the cygnus which definitely gives me space 1999 vibes yeah and a little bit of alien yeah i i like the this these are the robots in question this is uh vincent and then the broke down one i think was bob. robbie bob. 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 bob don't you dare bob. confuse him with robbie the robot that's a second <laughs> what, what makes like alcohol Vincent sir is. what makes alcohol this is true. He did make out. I want Robbie for that alcohol. This is the uniforms we're talking about. This is uh, Lieutenant Pfizer, uh, Captain Holland, and Kate, um, the empath scientist. Look at now, all that. They, they, look at the suits. They go down in that V, Sevy style, so you can see all the chest hair, all the, all yeah. the taco meat. All right. And then this is the remade one that they use when Disney is sells it now, which is a lot cleaner lines. You see the graphs that he was talking about. <laughs> No, I like the original name. better, actually. I like her the name was movie. Kate McRae. Thank you. I think they. I think yeah, they both have merit. The second one looks a little a bit like it's flying into a butthole, though. But <laughs> all right, well, hold on. Is. Yeah, is yeah. yeah, or the Eye of Saron. Yeah, that. See, the new one's like more uh, Eye of Sauron type. Uh, Hal. Um, yeah, it also gives me a little bit of Event Horizon vibes. Oh, yeah. I can see that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big time. So, no. so overall, did you guys like the poster? I did. I mean, I think definitely a period of its time, but it, the art did the job and made me want to know more. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it asked the question, what is this? Why do I care? And I'm like, I care because the poster is freaking awesome. Like, yeah, I know, like I said, I, I've seen some real life um, models of the Space 1999, and I'm definitely getting some of those vibes. But that was of the era what they thought spaceships would look like. Um, I do like it with the Palomino, and I couldn't find a picture of that, but with the Palomino, 
Um, it actually had the the rotating main hab, which would generate gravity for them. I, that they threw that in there, which was kind of cool. Yes, but go on. This it just wasn't as cool as the Cygnus. You know, yeah. the Cygnus is just absolute sex. I mean, it's just a sexy, sexy spaceship. It's, Go on. It's got all the, <laughs> that long lines. It's got all the gribbly bits. It's lit up like Wonderland. It's it's almost a spaceship from another movie, you know. Whereas the Palomino is kind of looks like a Disney spaceship. Sorry, but, you know, but no, the the Cygnus. Looked like it went more with function over form. It wasn't sexy and sleek like in Star Wars. Um, it looked like it had a purpose. It was meant for being in orbit. wasn't meant to go down to planets or anything like that. And all those little uh, like grates on the outside, you know, it, it was meant for people to have something to hold onto, hook onto, to work on while it's in flight. Um, but it still looked freaking cool. You know, it did yes. it like a giant Rubik's cube, like the Borg, you know, going more for function over form and just wouldn't look right. I mean, so I, think I, think it's also, I think it's also possible that the Cygnus had been built first. They'd spent a lot of time on it. And then cameras were going to roll on, you know, next week. And someone said, hey, where's the model for the other ship? And they went, other ship? <laughs> and they fell down, they, they went downtown Disney. Well, that wasn't a thing back then. Went to Disneyland, went to, you know, Tomorrowland, grabbed a toy out of the toy thing. They're like... Yeah, that's good enough. We're, we're going to channel our inner uh, mediocrities here and just run it on film. Put some lights on it. No one will know. No one will know. You know yeah. that ride right there to the right when you walk in? Like, you come off of off Main Street and then right there to the right. You know that ride? That's what the it needs rocket? to look oh, like. The, the rocket ride? Yeah, that's what I was thinking of, yeah. I'll buy that for a dollar. Or someone was like a really big fan of Thunderbirds. I get a little bit of Thunderbirds vibe from the, the Palomino. With the... No. <laughs> <laughs> Not as good as Thunderbirds. Thunderbird 2 would have looked better. Yeah, well, how come we're not... Well, as I said, they, they only had a week, right? And they probably <laughs> were already celebrating that they'd finished the big fancy models. They're half drunk. Just, uh... And yeah. I... <laughs> That's where the House of Ideas was coming from. Psychedelic narcotics. I applaud. Yeah, I, I'm digging it. So give me a second. I found a picture for you, dear listener, of the uh, Palomino. Everyone's going to see it and be like, that looks fine. Why are they making fun of it? <laughs> I mean, it could happen. <laughs> it's. <laughs> All right. It's the best I could do for a picture, but this is a sketch concept of the Palomino. It I mean, it looks also like looks... It looks like a lunar lander a bit too. Yeah, that's what I was just about to say. A yeah. lunar lander. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm not buying that for a dollar. I'm sorry. It just <laughs> no refunds. Looks like no it refund. was made for a different movie. Maybe. Maybe. Okay, that's what? fair. That's fair. All right. So uh, I am going to show you clip number one, which is the USS Cygnus. The, all the clips that I talk about will be linked in the show notes. We do not own these. These are from Walt Disney Productions. Again, copyright, blah, blah, blah. YouTube, please don't strike us. But this is the ships in question. Taxi million, bring us about. Trust us.
Blow it apart before it hits us. Fire! All right, so that clip was a little bit longer. If you guys want to see all of it, again, links in the show notes. But that gives you an idea of some of the cinematography that shows you the thickness both inside and out. You can see the vibes we're talking about. And you also got to see the uh, USS Palomino, which was nice. Does anybody know the significance of the Cygnus as the name of the ship? Uh, it was named after the black hole that was discovered called Cygnus. Yes, it was uh, discovered in the 68, I believe, 69, something like that. In the 60s, yeah. yeah. Um, it was Cygnus X-1 discovered in 64. I was in the right decade, wrong end of it. And the world was still black and white. Yes, yeah. the world was still black and white. So, still black and white. what did you guys think of the, the way they, they portrayed like the graphics? I thought for its time, it was good. It still holds up. Yeah, uh, it's animation over celluloid, so uh, it looks great. And that they still kind of do that today. They just do it in a CG model. But, uh, I, it holds up. I agree with you. So I made the 13-year-old sit down and watch it with me last night so I could do a, a recap before we got on this morning. And um, I was falling asleep because I was exhausted because I'm an old fart. But he's sitting there keeping me awake going, oh, man, Mom, did you see that? They're weightless. They're weightless. They didn't even do that in Star Wars. And I was like, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, did you see that special effect? That's awesome for its time. And I'm like, mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, keep it, up. We're going to send him to NYU and shit for film school. So he can well, make crap. the fact that he actually you know, sat there and, and enjoyed it just shows that it still holds up because, you know, these 13 year olds don't have that type of thought process. They're like, this is lame. This is old, but he was enjoying the heck out of it. This is old. I'm like, well, so am I. I'm funny and fun. <laughs> I actually, um, I don't know. I really liked the ship. I, I dig some of the older stuff. So I'm enjoying going back and revisiting some of the classics. Uh, I don't know if this is old enough to be considered a classic yet, but it, it will go with retro and we'll call it a day. No, it's a yeah. classic. I give it classic, classic rating. No, I, I definitely would like if I could get a model of the uh, Cygnus like to display. I'd totally put that in the uh, in the nerd room. Oh yeah, it they did a kit. They did a kit back in the day. Really? Yeah, wasn't very good, unfortunately. Sorry. So I know people are <laughs> printing now, so if anybody wants to just design that as a uh, as an STL file, and then I'll buy it when you print it, you just let me know. We'll talk. I feel like somebody that, somewhere probably has one. Yeah, I don't know. It looks kind of cool, though. That's the cool thing with some of the cover artists nowadays are designing the ships they, they do in, um, in 3D, so that way they can do the rotation on the cover. And so it's kind of cool that some of these authors will get like actual 3D models of the ships from their books, which I just, that is cool. that's, that's how, you know, you've arrived, Michael. That's how I, I'm not there yet, but I want to get there with, uh, with one of the ships from my books. If you have so. 600 to $700, they are selling them on eBay. Oof. Yeah. I didn't like it that much. <laughs> <laughs> Does it come with uh, Einstein Rosenbridge accessory? Yeah. <laughs> it, okay, so here's the thing that threw me off about it. I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, it's from 1979. They have all the pieces. Um, it's a desktop model. 
So it just sits on your desk. I am not spending $700 for something this big to sit on my desk. That's clearly because you're I'm a bad playing person. With it. It's not happening. I'm playing with it. I mean, you know, research purposes, Nick, for uh, future writing ventures. Nope. Artistic inspiration. I'm sure we could justify it. Worth a car nope. payment. Yeah, where's the carpet? So uh, that's the cool thing about um, being a creative is if you are creative enough, you can make anything a justifiable expense for your tax purposes. Yeah. Don't audit me, that's, please, IRS. Just go with it. That's, that's four Disneyland lightsabers. Three. Yeah. Four. So, that sounds like four. a good trade. Four. You've got lightsabers already. So, all right. So, we talked about the movie trailer. Uh, we've talked about the poster. Who do you guys think the main characters were? The robot. Oh, Vincent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought Vincent was pretty ass awesome, too. Yeah. And Bob, when Bob finally gets introduced. I like Bob. Vincent reminded me a little bit of R2-D2. So, I'm definitely seeing the Star Wars. Yeah, voiced by Roddy McDowell. You know, very, very awesome actor. I just watched Fright Night last night too. So he's in that. Yeah. Um, I think um, the main problem. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, you're good. Uh, I think the main problem was that the robots had more character than the actors had character. And, which is fine if the film had been marketed as a kid's movie, but it wasn't. It was marketed as a Star Wars like movie yeah. and whilst kids can like star wars it like any good film family film it can appeal it must appeal to both the adults watching it and the children and i think the problem with black hole is especially as an adult you, you'd look at that and go no it's not appealing which is why Madam Stabby Stab was going there and her th the 13 year old was going wow this is great because that's where it's pitched at. It's not pitched um, high enough. And as a writer, you know, when they're talking about the dialogue, all the where the dialogue shines, it doesn't shine very often, but where it does shine, the robots get the dialogue, not the humans. Mm -hmm. And it, it comes down to the type of dialogue. Um, we have this thing like, Oh, this is X and this is Y. It's effectively the equivalent of an uh, info dump. But any opinions or beliefs about what's going on, what, that they're given to the robots and they're supposed to be robots and they're more human than the humans. And uh, and they wasted Ernest Borgnine and they wasted uh, the uh, uh, the guy who uh, from Psycho. Um, you know, hey, Perkins. Yeah, Perkins, that's it. Anti Sorry, I'm getting old. I can't remember these names. And uh, But the villain was good. He really chewed the scenery, you know. And that's also great. But it's it's like a curate's egg. It's great in parts, but overall it's pretty bad. Um, you know, and I really want to love this movie because it has the Cygnus in it and it has robots and it has going into the black hole and I so want to love it. But Had Bird Night. I mean, if he can't save a movie, I don't know what can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they wasted him. He was so great in there. He, they made him the comic relief. The robots, kind of the protagonist, they kind of drugged the plot along. I, I don't know. Yeah, they did a lot of coke in that writing room. Because <laughs> <laughs> these I, characters don't make sense. Well, let's, speaking of characters, you're right. I thought that there was a little bit of flatness to it. I can see what you mean. Uh, but I'm going to show you the clip with uh, with Maximilian and then the robots uh, so you can see what we're talking about, dear listener. These are going to be shorter clips. <laughs> hey, there's someone else with us. Identify yourself. What is your type and model? The mystery monster. Don't move. 
Charlie, do you read me? Charlie, Papa, you come in, Charlie. This is the story to end all stories, Harry. A ship of robots and computers with this thing in charge? Not quite, Dr. Durant. Maximilian and my robots only run this ship the way I wish it run. How do you know my name? You were monitored ever since our sensors first detected you. Now, now, Maximilian, calm down. All right. We, we left it for a few extra seconds on uh, Maximilian's little uh, agitator arms. I'm just saying that if you're mixing a cake, you'd be a handy robot to have. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Well, could you imagine how the film would have looked if they had the original, well, who they wanted for the female lead, Sigourney Weaver, but they said her last name was too intense or weird or something like that? Yeah. Like, a, whole, was, a whole different film. But she actually does character acting, and this this acting laid into the cheese in the camp like we've, we talked about. I don't think it was as bad as, as Ashley thought, but I definitely don't think it was as serious as, like, the Forbidden Planet tried to be. With with the um, the effects, this one definitely felt more like, you know, leaning into the campiness. I, I felt like a GI Joe episode where everyone laughs at the end and somehow nobody gets shot. I mean, obviously people died in this movie, but well, um, we don't want to spoil it. But there were characters that died. Um, this but it movie definitely came in 1979. If you if this is a spoiler, I want you to go into the kitchen, get yourself a nice iron. And then smack yourself in the face with it for being offended that we spoiled the show for you. All right, all right. So the uh, the the engineer, the Scottish engineer guy, which was like a, a rip off of the engin- engineer in Star Trek. Uh, he he bought the bullet for being a cowardice, which is a moral lesson. Cowardice never pays. People stand with your buddies. Um, and then um, the scientist got uh, agitated to death by uh, by Robbie the robot. <laughs> That's for you, Michael. Robbie the robot. Thanks. Maximilian. <laughs> so I thought that was good, and then uh, we'll show you a little bit closer up, and then we're gonna we're gonna dive in. That was Maximilian, and now let's look at the other robots. You can see uh, Vincent and his buddy, his mini me. You'd have beat him again if he hadn't bumped you. Nah, I didn't miss on purpose. Don't worry, I'll uphold the honor of the old outfit. Stop. Vincent's my name. Sharpshooting's my game. Try me. Try this. All right, and that goes on a little bit in the clip. Again, I'm not trying to do the whole like hours of clips, but uh, that was what we were talking about when when Ashley mentioned that it felt like the good dialogue was wasted on the uh, robot. Um, they definitely gave them a lot of personality, but. Uh, they should have shared it with some of the humans. And the cinematography was just a bit flat. Yeah. It was all center frame, which you don't do because as comic artists, we study cinematography. You don't want stuff center on center. It's boring, even when you're firing laser guns. <laughs> yes. Um, I do, like you said, I did I did think the um, the bumbling country bumpkin effect for the, the broken down robot. It definitely Bob. gave me some Pixar vibes with uh, Mater. Yes. Yeah, and they got Slim Pickens to voice it, which is awesome. Is <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Strangelove, he, he's the guy that's like riding the freaking nuclear warhead. Yeah! You know, so I think that was perfectly cast. Um, I'll, what did he say? I'll, I'll upkeep the honor of the old unit. Yeah. You know? 
It's like if they had robot chew, I guarantee you he had one in. Yeah. Yeah. Ding, you know, banging off Star's helmet after he gets defeated. That'll go in the remake. Remix. Yeah. I hope they would you actually it. like to see this as a remake with modern technology? I, I would actually. Absolutely. 100%. As long as they um, rewrite the dialogue. And yeah. yeah. Definitely. Some of the modern remakes where they try to, you know, we have to have insert uh, all these um, minority groups that, you know, insert checkbox. Like if they do that to it, I probably wouldn't enjoy it. But for instance, I've used this as an example of how to, to give representation to do it right with Starbuck in the remake of Battlestar Galactica. Her character, when they changed gender and made her the love interest of the dead brother, that worked for me because it actually made her relationship with the main character's family, um, that made sense to me now, instead of just some weird, um, just some weird, oh, we're just buddies because, you know, we, we like to chase girls together or whatever from the original, the Playboy, I guess, motif. So I think if they're gonna update it, they definitely need to do it in a way that fits the plot instead of just, you know, checks a box. It can be done right. Yeah, let me, let me run with that. I mean, I have no problem with, having a diverse uh, cast. The problem with diverse cast is you have to then up your game for the characterization and for the dialogue. And that's what they fail to do every single time. They just stick it in. Oh, we've ticked the box. That's it. That's all we've got to do. Nothing else matters. The heart of any story is the character motivations. You know, we could talk about Star Wars and uh, the, uh, the Force Awakens with Ray, but we won't because that would be off on the rant, and I'll just stop now. <laughs> yeah, she was definitely the Mary Sue of all Mary Sues. No, she wasn't. Oh, sorry. The story in the uh, the Force Awakens is basically just a, a very bad retelling of a new hope. That yeah. pretty much beat the beat. Yeah. Um, and that's why you know the new hope worked because they they raised the dialogue and they, they did stuff with the characters and they got the beats right. But in The Force Awakens, because it was just a a copy, it was inferior. And because there's no real difference between Luke and Ray. You know, both desert planets, both pretty good pilots, you know. Um, Ray's got a bit of an edge in terms of the Force stuff, but then again, she hasn't had Uncle uh, Lou and Auntie Berea looking after her for all her life. She's had to live on the edges, and you'd have to be one tough kid to actually survive what they showed in, in the opening of The Force Awakens. So she would be, she would have some serious street cred to still be alive all those years later. Whereas Luke needed a bit of guidance with Obi Wan to to kind of level up. So I don't think she's a Mary Sue. I just think if you've watched um, pitch meetings, he explains pretty much what's wrong with the Force Awakens, and it's all down to lazy storytelling. Well, when it comes to Luke, Luke had there was years in between each episode. So he had time to look at Jedi text. He had time to deal with uh, force ghosts and things like that. That whole sequel trilogy, there's no years passed between. It's just yeah. boom, 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 boom. So where did Ray get all this freaking knowledge from? That's down to but, poor writing. That is just, you know, okay. because they, they didn't have, I, I mean, we're getting off topic. This is yeah, about, I was about, to, about oh, to get us back. Talking about the sequel trilogy, maybe four. All right, so Ashley, we'll have you back on, and we can discuss the uh, whether she's a Mary Sue or it's just a, a poorly designed clone. Uh, I can see your argument. I, I think the end result is it felt unsatisfying. Um, yeah, much I, I, I don't have any argument with that. Um, I have an argument with her being a Mary Sue, um, and I think that's largely down to. Um, Stop. So we're showing you some of the some of the screen grabs that uh, Stabby found for us. Um, this is um, the 
the to the wish version of the Star Trek engineer. Um, we've That's got nine. You you show some respect, sir. <laughs> we've got Vincent and Bob. Uh, a little damaged, a little worse for wear. And then I, of course I like the, the wires coming out of Bob because it's like a almost like a beard. <laughs> yeah. And of course uh, the attire, you know, uh, he looks like That's he's doing some kung fu. Kung Fu would have made it a little better, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Gun kata. But that's a great scene, isn't it? That one with that, that. that's just, a, you know, visually great. I liked that one a lot. I did too. But so um, let's get back on track. So we've talked about the um we've talked about the effects and the cinematography what let's let's go back to that um, a little bit so what did you think of some of the camera angles in the way they set the scene I, I think i agreed with nick's earlier assessment i definitely felt like whoever was filming it was tripping a little bit because it was like dizzying all the flashing lights definitely need a seizure warning for people to watch that because oh my god the flashing lights but what did everyone else think of, of the way they did the camera angles and like, some of the make a movie for ep epileptics yeah, that's not. That's not, that's, so, that's not. I mean, I think any time that they're kind of showing off the matte paintings they did, it looks good. Um, like I love this the shot where it's the the Cygnus control and it like shows how grand it is and all the little drones working and it just looks looks almost gothic a tiny bit. Like it has this real almost like Dante's Inferno, like you're looking into layers of hell kind of vibe. Um, and there's sequences like that, and then they get off the matte painting onto whatever five by five set they shot on and it looks very static and it looks very blah and it looks very sitcom like television almost yeah um and i i kind of wonder if some of that is again we have these matte paintings we have all these things we want to show let's make sure they look gorgeous oh right we have other things to shoot uh just get them done in a weekend um like it just felt like there were certain things that they took time with that they really wanted to show. And then it felt like there was other items that they just didn't care to or didn't have time to really make well. And I'm not sure, you know, exactly what the issue is, but yeah, there's there's moments where it feels like different movies almost. Yeah. Yeah, I can um, see that. And I think the tone of the movie also has that as well, where it has like a tonal whiplash between is this a kid's movie? Is this kind of like a weird almost re like a sci-fi revision of an old gothic sort of story is this you know because it has like a real haunted house kind of element to it and but then you have zany robots that you know as nick said should be spitting chew in the saloon somewhere um so yeah I don't, it's, it, it is a, it is a mixed bag it is a very mixed bag where, where especially as an adult watching it you kind of just raise an eyebrow a lot <laughs> um so because the, like the, the lasers look fine you know uh for the era they're they're fine they're 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 doable the models all look pretty decent there's elements that look decent and then there's the costumes and there's like even the i i still kind of like the design of the drones the control drones but even they are super super simple like they were designed over a weekend you know we stitched like a little black jumpsuit with a cloak and then a mirror mask and yeah you're done um yeah, yeah that's good that'll work uh, you know we spent all our time making the weird stormtrooper robots so you know that that took effort so we don't got time for anything else um, those were were reused for the uh for tron they never made it to the film but when they did the pitch for tron the, that's what they used for the uh all the henchmen and i think that could work um, but yeah, so, um, that's, that's kind of where I, where I come from, um, is it's, it's just a mixed bag. Like I can't, I can't say definitively that it's great or that it's terrible because it's this, weird it's, in, it's this weird in between where, yeah, there's, there's definitely fantastic elements and there's a lot of elements where it could have been so much better. I, I could almost imagine the director going, I've got these lovely match shots and stuff. And yeah, like you said, MD, you know, this is going to look awesome. And then the rest of it is kind of like, oh, wow, well, this is boring dialogue. So it's just a boring shot. You know, 
And let's yeah. move on to the next match. Yeah. Shot. Apparently, they commissioned some artists to do. I think he did like almost two hundred matte paintings, and they used less than twenty of them. So somewhere out there is just a stack of just a hundred more gorgeous matte paintings that just got lost. I thought that one was so cool. I was when I was doing the research, I was like, "Oh my god, look at this movie poster." It's almost cooler than the original one. I, was I feel just like the like, Japanese it's... always get cooler posters than we do. They yeah. do, man. That, that whole yep. anime culture they got, which goes like, way back in the 60s. You're seeing them go into the black hole, but then you look at the screen to the left, and you're seeing them go into the black hole. Like, they they really just, they kind of did, they did the dang thing with this one. They're like, what if we put a droid outside the ship with a camera to see us going into the black hole? Yeah. Yeah, put While in that we're going into the black, black hole. <laughs> yeah, it's um the art for the matte stuff, I mean, I, I I agree. That's kind of stuff you'd want like framed on a wall, kind of just good art. Oh, absolutely. Um I, I could definitely see them turning that into some sort of graphic novel as well with that style. Um it definitely, it definitely reminded. What's the um, Buck Rogers vibe to it? Some of the matte paintings. Yeah, um, I can, I can feel that. Yeah. So, what did you think of the uh, incorporation of the telepathy, the telepathic connection between Kate and the robot? That kind of struck me as like out of left field. Like, I, I get we're in the future, we've got tech, but suddenly we're telepathic. I mean, I think it's a really awesome. Sorry, I'm just jumping in there. I think it's a really awesome inclusion that's never explored at all. Yeah. Like, it is a really cool concept that could have been a neat element to expand character and story. And you could have had, like, a really beautiful relationship between Kate and Vincent where, you know, like, you could have just gone really deep with it. And it's just a thing that somebody wrote five seconds on a page. I'm starting to think that they, um, Star Wars stole that when they went further with Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. You know, the uh, it was almost an empathic communication between Luke and R2. So I think... I think it was a really great introduction of the concept and uh, some other films have gone forward with it, but that's something you usually don't see. And, you know, when you do any type of tele uh, telepathic stuff or empathic stuff, it's between a life form and a life form. And they had a relationship with a, with cold hard steel and gadgets and circuitry. And I thought that was cool. I'm going to put my hard, hard SF hat on now and say, you don't need telepathy or, with the robot what you need is effectively wi-fi i could imagine that she's got an implant or she's wearing something that just allows her to have direct you know one-to-one -one interface with vincent and it didn't need to be hand waved as telepathy it could have been part of the technology but that's because i'm kind of a hard sf kind of gal oh i think i think that would have been a neat again any it's a Having her have a connection with the robot is a fun yeah. thing that's just not, they just don't do anything with it. Yeah. Like, it's so infrequently utilized or referenced. And, you know, whether again, if it is like some sort of telepathy or it's a plug in or whatever, um, like it would have been fun. It's this new dynamic you've introduced to the story. So let's make the story more <laughs> dynamic. Yeah. yeah, and I, you could tell someone did some study in on uh, the research of Nikola Tesla, who essentially, I mean, if you read his fightings and things that he created, he created Wi-Fi. He can get, you know, any, um, forgot my words. Credit for it. <laughs> Can't believe I forgot credit. But anyway, uh, Nikola Tesla had a whole bunch of things like that. If he could recreate, he had like a theory about like human brain waves that could be harnessed through something he it was wi-fi but he called it something different and then he started dealing with the electronic aspect of it so the, the writers kind of did a little a little research which is entertaining I yeah think, go ahead sorry, go, go ahead jr i was gonna say i think when you, we mentioned the wi-fi i wonder how much of that was a lack of knowledge at the time they were writing well no i mean they had radio waves I don't know. I, I wonder how much of that is we're looking at it with our understanding of modern tech that they could have used as examples that they might not have been aware of at the time. Well, as the old person in this conference, uh, not to stress it, but back then I was, however old I was, old mm -hmm. enough. 
no, we had technology. You know, uh, us old SF fans understood things like, you know, lasers and computers and stuff. We didn't have that technology uh, to hand, like, you know, I have a, we're doing all this over the computer now. Um, so, yeah, the problem is that the writers who are writing this weren't science fiction writers. They were Hollywood script writers. And they're going to be falling into all the Hollywood cliches of what makes a good story without realizing that science fiction, what makes science fiction science fiction is the interaction between the humans and the technology. Whereas these people that the technology is kind of like Ooh, it's that black box over there. I don't understand it. And I'm not even going to be bothered to learn to understand or even think outside of my box of what I understand technology can do. That's my take. Okay. What is, uh, what do you think, Mike? I mean, I don't, I think, I think that's pretty, it's pretty probable. Um, I don't know much about, you know, the personally, the people that wrote it, but I, I still think that it suffered from probably multiple, multiple drafts written by multiple, multiple people like sitting around and, you know, writer A is like, I wrote this and writer B takes 50% of it and then inserts their own 50% and then writer C takes 50% of that and inserts, you know, so it's possible. Yeah, it's possible that writer B was like a really big science fiction fan, but everybody else wasn't. And they're like, well, that doesn't make sense. That's stupid. And they're like, no, that's real science. And they're like, shut up. You know, I'm going to change that. The children don't want real science. They want cute robots. Um, yeah, we do. So, so, yeah, like it's because like, as I mentioned, the tonal shift before, it feels like such a hodgepodge of ideas that like it's there is no coherent vision to this movie. Um, and that's coming from somebody I sincerely love this movie. Um, I, I will admit I watched it recently and I was like, yeah, it's it's got a lot of issues. But um you know, I, I grew up adoring this movie. My poor mother, I can't tell you how many times we, we would watch this. With, and she probably was like, dear God, kill me now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the but, but yeah, like I told you, JR, it was between this and Tron, like over and over again. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's it just it's it's literally like the Hollywood grab bag of ideas. Um, yeah. yeah. So and then and when you get that Hollywood grab bag a lot of uh, the kind of technical substance is going to go to the wayside. Yeah. You got anything to add, uh, Ashley? No, I agree with MD. I, th I think uh, it's too many cooks uh, ruined the broth. Um, there were clearly far too many cooks in this one cooking up the plot. Um. It is a grab bag. There are bits of it, I would agree, are just awesome. I just look at this and it blows me away. You know, the Cygnus and the black hole. I mean, just imagine if we could have the black hole done like from Interstellar and some, you know, proper, like we're not going into the black hole, we're going between the two event horizons because it's a spinning black hole. And yeah, okay, that's a bit geeky and technical, but it's like, but like cutting like edge science, you know? And this is what we're doing. We're going to be traversing a Einstein Rosen bridge um, to another part in space time. And it wouldn't, you, you could keep the cute robots. You can still have cute robots. Just, let's just make the eyes a bit more scientific, technological, technological, not scientific, just technological, rather than just white pieces, with, you know. I mean, even googly eyes would almost be better than what we see on Bob and Vincent. You know. Oh, I'm still editing this movie and putting googly eyes on the robots. <laughs> googly eyes. <laughs> yeah, but having more like a Daft Punk changing emotion type screen, like if they decided to remake it, that, yeah. that would probably be really cool. You could have green because green is opposite to red and red for Maximilian, you could have a green glow and, and maybe just a simple 
almost like a style on, you know, by your command. Yeah. Oh, going on. Yeah. Supposedly they've been trying to remake it for a couple decades, and I think it's been permanently shelved because they felt it'd be too similar to Interstellar now. Um, I wouldn't see that. I will also say this could be a good thing because the last screenwriter was the same person who wrote the Pacific Rim sequel and Jurassic Park Dominion. So, oh, you know, those people could be imprisoned. Just going from a quality place already. So, you know. Oh, that movie would flop so hard like a pancake. Gross. So, every other recent Disney movie? Yeah, sadly. Yeah, they could, they could stand to lose another billion or two. Yeah, it just makes you wonder, doesn't it? I mean, how do you get to be that stupid? You stupid. start to believe your own PR and you think that if you build it, they will come and it doesn't matter if they have a plot. And it just, writers, I mean, uh, consumers um, have more options now, not less. And then I think consumers, I mean, we look at Dust, for instance, the YouTube channel, and what they do on a shoestring budget that blows away modern cinema with quality scripts and quality acting and minimal special effects. And it sort of shows us what we're missing, I think. Uh, whereas before, indie films were sort of regulated to, if you weren't at the Cannes Festival, you didn't see it. Yeah. Well, now you can see these movies. Now, some of them are there for a reason. They're just weird. And weird has its place, too. But I think... I think the consumers have a more discerning palette in some ways than they used to. Because before it was like, this is your only option. You will take it and you will like it, sir. Yeah. Uh, they'll sacrifice uh, creativity and entertainment for their bottom line. And I think that's where the problem is. If you're more concerned about making money than actually creating a quality product, it's probably going to fail. Yeah. But, you know, the counter argument is you'll make more money with a quality product. Than you were with a piece of shod, shoddy work like this, in terms yeah, of the yeah. plot, in terms of the characters and the dialogue. I mean, the basic plot of Black Hole is is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the the, the, the basic arc of the story. You know, one spaceship meets another spaceship. This other spaceship is the mystery. It all goes horribly wrong. They end up plummeting through the wormhole. None of that's wrong. That, Sounds like that, a romantic all, film. All yeah. really could work, you know, works perfectly fine. It's just the um, the execution of it. um I've lost the word. Um the process, the the treatment. It's just the treatment of the story that fails. And that's why we're getting this um dichotomy. Sorry to use big fancy words, but I've been watching <laughs> Patrick Eight Willems. Um film channel on YouTube where he talks about all this stuff and it's the treatment that's lacking and it's because they don't respect they didn't respect the material it's oh it's just that SF stuff you don't have to respect that it would just say whatever and there it is it's it's science fiction in it mate in it not yeah, off, not off. The, it's science the fiction to that is the remake of Doom that had everything it it went really deep into um, Herbert's vision. It had great special effects. The dialogue was well acted. Um, and they realized that this story needs more than just two hours. So I, I think it gives, it gives me hope that some of these great movies that were not really well executed, they, but you can see the potential in them. And I think that's the most troubling thing. You see that it had great potential with this great film. And uh, it fell short in so many ways that it wasn't. But you still find like your little pieces that you enjoy very much, like the sickness, uh, the execution of the sickness, great looking shit, um, the matte paintings, um, the acting was, dialogue was crap, uh, the uh, the robots, and things like that. So maybe Hollywood's waking up and we'll start getting some good stuff again. <laughs> but. Well, they've been firing some of the people that were involved with some of the disastrous stuff. I think the stance they took on the Snow White movie with regard to firing the person that seems to hate everything about the original and actually trying to honor the original and they're essentially making a completely new remake. It's a new film, I think. I think that was an expensive lesson for them. 
So hopefully, hopefully. So we we didn't talk about the main character. Well, one of the main characters in the form of the bad guy, which was Doctor. How do I pronounce this? Rein Reinhardt. 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 He's a villain. He's got to have a German name. Come on, man. Of course. Yeah. Right. This is Germany. We make the best. This is the best villains. Yeah. If this is. We're not. We're not to the point where all the villains are Russians yet. We're still the villains are Germans. <laughs> no, we're still dealing with Germans. <laughs> So whatever you think of him, he felt a little mustache twirly and not as well flushed out to me. Yeah, I mean, he, he felt like a, a poor iteration of Dr. Mobius from the Forbidden Planet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, like I feel like Mobius, they're, they they're very similar, except one feels a lot more, like, just more sympathetic, more real, more, like, like Mobius is just a much more interesting character. Uh, Reinhardt. Yeah, he, he is a must out. He's a very Shakespearean style villain. Like, I'm not saying yeah. he has the level of a Shakespearean villain, but there's this. I feel like they brought in the actor and they said, Look, this is who you're going to play. And he's like, Oh, of course. Like, here I go. And scenery he's like chew the, away. He's the great value brand <laughs> Shakespearean villain. It's like he's close, but he's still kind of, it tastes different. <laughs> you know? I mean, for all the mustache twirling he did, his facial hair was not on point. I'm just but he saying. had a glorious beard, man. Oh yeah, he had a glorious beard. I strive to have that type. I of mean, beard. I'm I'm expecting like wax handlebars that he can literally twirl. He needs a <laughs> hat he can pat. Well, he also um, needs railroad something. tracks to tie a woman to, you know. Um, yeah. But um, I, so he's when you great, watch, he has a great voice though. I, I love did. his voice. When you watched it originally, what were your thoughts on the villain? Was it in keeping with the time, or did it feel kind of cheap then too? <laughs> It didn't feel it, the villain didn't feel cheap. I mean, he is a bit cheesy, you know. In hindsight, that wasn't my problem with the movie. My problem with the movie was all the things we've discussed, like the robots and the dialogue, and, and the villain. I, yeah, he could have been done better, but he was done well enough at the time. I think we're kind of looking at this now, nearly fifty years later. It's not quite fifty years; forty plus years later. And yeah, tastes have changed. And yeah, he doesn't fit today's zeitgeist. Oh, I'm using all these big fancy words. I must be a writer. And uh, um, so, yeah, no, I was okay with uh, Reinhardt. Uh, he's not as good as Morbius, as you said, um, but he wasn't given the script. No. So I think the actor could have done a much better job had he been given the the script to work with yeah i think he also didn't have he, like he didn't have a he didn't have a as strong of a human stake in the story um he's just like i have evil plan and i do evil things Mwah. and then like we said like mobius had like he had a daughter he had he lost a wife he had all these things that made him more of a stronger character there was, he was there a was relatable more, villain. Yeah, there was more depth to him. Yeah, he also was meddling with things he didn't fully understand, which made it tragic. Like the, like again, the climax of that where he's like, "Robbie killed the monster," and Robbie's like, "I can't. It's you." Um, like that. That's some fantastic little bits that Reinhardt never gets any of that. He just literally is. I want to do thing, and I will do thing. I, I think the, the, the villain, go ahead. It's more of Sam Neill's character in Event Horizon than Morbius in Forbidden Planet. Um, it's like, like you said, it's I want to do said thing and I'm going to do said thing, and you can't talk me out of it. I don't care how much logic you throw at me; it's not going to happen. But even um, even Nick, Sam Neill's character <laughs> had like he had lost his wife. He had this like human element that made him more again dynamic. Like there was right. there was a cost to the to the journey that had been on, like. If Reinhardt and was it like Kate, Kate's dad or whatever, had been on yeah. the ship, like if they had been best friends or like anything akin brothers, you know, suddenly there's these just new elements. There's a new stake. Um, I felt God, it, to this. Yeah, if, if, it, if it had been his brother, that friend. would have been fascinating because then he would have been Kate's uncle, and now it's literally this whole. There's a family element, and she's connected to Vincent through the through the neurological implant. And man, we just wrote a better movie. Um, <laughs> All right, let's write the so, better route then. <laughs> so I will say that I think, you know, given the time and what was developing, this was, you know, as the nuclear arms race was still going on. I mean, like we'd already obviously dropped the bomb in World War II, but everyone was afraid of the, the Cold War nuclear race. 
so the danger of knowledge for the sake of knowledge, dam like with the damn the torpedoes full speed ahead sort of mentality, I think that warning fit the time and place where he was a villain from. With that being said, they still poorly executed that if that was the mission because they didn't give any build up to it or lead up. They just, oh, he's a megalomaniacal crazy man who didn't want to be relieved because he was crazy. And, and then, oh, by the way, he's a scientist who's brilliant, who wants answers to all the questions. Like they couldn't pick a lane, I think was part of the problem. Cause I think wanting answers and that the, the pursuit of knowledge driving you mad, like that is compelling. But I also don't think that's quite an excuse because, you know, like, like Ashley said, you know, we're looking at this from a different era and pop culture zeitgeist, all that nonsense. But again, this is this is a hundred years or whatever after Frankenstein. And you could compare Reinhardt to Frankenstein, where he is a man driven and he creates a monster. But in the case, again, of Frankenstein, the whole story is the the cost of his humanity. And you see it, you appreciate it, you feel his pain. Um, even if you don't, you don't agree with his methods, but Reinhardt doesn't get any of that. He starts as evil and ends as super evil. Um, and uh, like, or do you care, Jr. about spoilers? Can we talk about spoilers at all? Yeah, yeah, Mom, yeah. Send them, send the spoilers. Okay, so like, I love to pitch this to people as like, oh yeah, it's a Disney movie that ends in hell, because like there really is no other clear definition to that ending. Except nope, literally, it, it is a robot and a man merged in hell. Um, so, yeah, he he doesn't get anything. He he they wrote him as we need somebody who is driven to drive into a black hole, and he will kill anybody who doesn't let him drive into the black hole. So, um, stop him from driving into the black hole. Yeah. Um I just had the thought, the way you really treat him is, is like Moby Dick. The black hole is the whale. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, and Ahab is, is, a, is a, a famous literary character because of the, the cost of it all and the obsession. And, like, you see the, the suffering because of somebody's fixation on something. Um, well, and the, you use that later on, like, uh, with Thanos in the Marvel movie. He's a Captain Ahab. He's a, uh, you know, it's the man too driven where at all costs, I'm going to do what I need to do because I believe it's the right thing to do. I think that's probably one of the most dangerous types of villains you could have because you can't argue with that. They right. feel that is the most right thing to do. Uh, and he doesn't have to have a redemptive arc. He doesn't need a moment where he's like, oh, I will disable the shield so you can fly away. I sorry. No, the last thing he says is more light. I think he cries out for Maximilian is the last thing he says. Yeah. Where Maximilian's yeah. like, I'm gonna fly away. And he's like, Maximilian. And that's that. I think that's the only real moment where he's like, I made all these machines, but they're not gonna save me. Yeah. Um, there was there was also the scene where he warns um Kate to get away after Maximilian agitates the uh the other scientist to death. Oh yeah. Um, oh, where, where he's you get the impression he's afraid of his creation. Yeah, I also, I don't, sorry, I, I asked no, no, you were no, going to talk, but, but that's a really good point because I feel like there is this element in that movie that's not defined where Maximilian is more than just a robot. That's and, what I was going to say. It comes back to the Vincent um, link with the, what's her name? The woman. With Kate, um, yeah. Yeah. And she's got that link, and I kind of, it's kind of suggestive that Maximilian's got that link with Reinhardt, except Maximilian's in charge. Yeah. Yeah, like there oh, is yeah. an implication that who, you know, who is the real captain here? And there even is that clip you showed, JR. There is that almost could be telling line where they said, look, a ghost ship made by robots, run by robots. And then Reinhardt's like, hey, hey, I, hey, I'm in charge um yes from the, from the shadows so what is he um but i again that's just an element that could have been explored with a lot more dignity and just a lot more time um it didn't need to be the focal point of the film of course but it's just all this surface level element that's just left to rot we ought to pair up and write the script because i think between the two of us we've got it nailed <laughs> A co-writing venture built on our podcast. I'm I'm here for it. 
And uh, and Stabby, you can do the special effects. Re 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 re. She's muted. <laughs> I am so tired. I am so sorry, guys. Like, you, you're I'm fine. normally more talkative. I'm so she she weak. also takes all of our hashtag notes for us throughout the episode. So yes, that's, that's, I have that's been. Little phone. I keep looking down, like right. So overall, we've talked about the plot, sort of feeling like. It almost was a movie without a plot. I mean, there was a kind of a, a, a goalpost that they set for themselves, but they kind of bounced all over the place like a ping pong ball all, all over the screen. Um, but what did you think of the way they handled the world building? I, th I think it. We've, we've touched upon it in that it's been very lacking. <laughs> yeah. Ideas are it's presented like and, and then immediately they go talk about something else. There was no buildup to it. It was like, hey, we found the ship that's been missing. Oh, I know the doctor on that ship. You should go check it out. Well, and then speaking of that missing ship, did you guys catch that when they were looking through the database, all the other missing ships they linked to and space stations that just disappeared? They're like, oh, is it this? No, it's not this. It's not this. No, I didn't catch that. No. But, but that already is an interesting plot element, like an interesting story thing that's just not even mentioned. What happened to these other ships? What's the story there? Yeah, is it is it all black holes? Is it all Reinhardt? We don't know, but the script doesn't care, so. Yeah, maybe it'll further the plot, but it doesn't. Okay, so overall, because we've been going at this for about an hour and a half, um, and you know That's we could really probably, it. yeah, we could probably keep rambling up all over the place in the field of the sci-fi we know and love. But what was your overall thoughts on it? Um, we'll go with you first before you fall asleep on us, Dabby. What did you think of the movie? What did you think of what did you think of the movie? I I liked it. Um, I think that they spent all of their money on special effects and the robots and didn't save enough for the writers. That's just what it comes down to. But I did quite enjoy it. Um, I forgot that I watched it. This is the saddest thing. So I forgot that I watched this with Nick. I thought we only watched Forbidden Planet. Um, so when it started, I was like, no, I haven't seen this one because they didn't have girls in it until they landed on the planet um, in the other one. So no, I haven't seen this one. And then it really started going. I'm like, wait a minute, that's the wrong robot. I'm like, wait a minute. Where's Robbie? I've seen this. I was like, wait a minute, I have seen this one. And I think that's why it was a little bit easier for me to start dozing off when the kid was getting into it because I was like, okay, yeah, I saw this. I don't need to recap good night. Um, but um yeah, it kind of struck me this morning as I was like throwing on my clothes and making coffee before I logged on. I was like, was that really I freeze this. I was like, was that really um, how not memorable this movie was? It's the best way I can figure out how to say this right now. No, because I really, I, I remembered all the things about Forbidden Planet, but I forgot we watched Black Hole. I completely I forgot. They're very similar movies, like almost parallel. I was like, no, I, I didn't see this one because there's no women on the ship in the movie that we watched. So this has to be a new movie that we didn't watch. And then once it got going, I was like, wait a minute, we did watch this. How did I forget that we watched this? And then it was like, oh, wow, I forgot that we watched this. And I think that okay. made it a little bit more sad. Okay. Okay. All right. What about you, um, Ortiz? So overall thoughts? Yeah. Um. Look, again, as I said, this, this movie is always going to have a special place to me. Um, it's it's a flawed piece of 70s sci-fi. That's the best way to describe it. Um, I don't think you should try and oversell it to somebody. But at the same time, I think it is worth a watch for anybody that's interested in kind of like older science fiction or just, um, I mean, honestly, just sci-fi in general. It's it's got a special place and it's got some iconic elements. I feel like especially things like Vincent and Maximilian are weirdly surpassed the legacy of this movie. Um, I have met people that 
you know, we didn't know that we knew the movie, but then you do this and someone's like, that's that robot from that thing. And you're like, yeah. Um, so I think there, there's some sort of element there that transcends the subpar nature of everything else. And maybe it is those little nuggets of goodness that you get from it. But it is 1000% a film that I would like to see remade. Um, I think that in the realm of, you know, Hollywood's got to remake everything. Why don't we actually remake movies that never reached their potential when they got made the first time? And that, this is a prime candidate to me. I think, I think storytelling wise, character wise, visually, all those things, as long as you still understand the tone you're going with, um, could be a really epic movie. And I do think that it is a little special that there is, there is almost like a child element to it. And yet it's pretty creepy because to me as a kid, I think that was some of the draw that I had zany robots shooting laser guns, but there's like lobotomizations and, you know, weird metaphysical pseudo psychedelic nonsense and, you know, scenery chewing villains. Like there is this kind of spookiness to it that I think a lot of, media for younger people kind of get sanitized now. Um, okay. So I think that that's like, I, th I think again, you could still make it like a family, a family movie um, and have it be spooky and surreal. I think a series would probably be best for it. That would be cool too. Like, I, th I think let's go with a mini series. Cause I think there's too much issue yeah. where, they're, where they're like, we got to keep it going. And you're like, you didn't have to, you could just have a no, story. But <laughs> They're going to give me 10 episodes of some awesome stuff. Like the haunting of Hill house. That yes. doesn't need to be a continuing series, yes. um, but it's a great mini series. You know, it, it goes into depth of what we want to focus on and, just completes that story, and I think I think you're right. That would for a, for a series that would be amazing. I've watched ten episodes of the Black Hole. So, and I think yeah, like you have it be the mystery of the Black Hole, the mystery of the ship, the mystery of the Reinhardt. You have all that. Um, heck, you could have one of the people that comes from the Palomino be somehow connected, and it's like they didn't find the ship by accident. Um, almost like a very alien vibe, right? Like you could. Yeah, infuse some you, of that you, element. You could go into depth with the other missing vessels. That was sure, going to go sure. You could have really it be that there's there there's something out there. Maybe there is something even extraterrestrial that we don't know about. Um, I think there's a lot of a lot of avenues you can go with it, and I would Absolutely. I would love for somebody to take the time and tell this story in a way that makes it much more satisfying than uh, two two robots having a old west shootout in a weird You're simulation joking. like i, I still to this day still to this day are they shooting real things are they shooting digital things like because i'm like is there a hole in the ship that they're just like is it a force field and they're just launching pods out there i don't know so i think you are onto something with the mini um the mini series because i actually over the last two days i forced my kid to watch the haunting of hill house and he goes mom why do they make it into 10 episodes? I'm like to give you all the information because they should just put it all together, take some of the stuff out and just put it into one movie. So as soon as we finish haunting of Hill house, I made him watch the haunting from 1999. And he goes, it's Nell. It's Theo. It's Luke, but they're not siblings. Wait, he, the dad is Hugh Crane, but he's a monster in this one. And he goes, this movie's not giving me the information I need. Is this before or after? And I'm like, that's why they made the series, bud, to give you the information that we didn't get in the movie in 1999. So I think you're definitely onto something with, with the series because then you get all the information over, you know, eight, 10 episodes versus just this, you know, hour and a half movie where you're sitting there going, right, but why <laughs> and it would also be epic to see a, a nice quality sci-fi miniseries that's not just a sequel to something or right popping out of the of an existing ip that they know you know you're, you're gonna you're gonna want to see because you gotta be a completionist um because yeah i feel like again we are in an era where you're seeing these like miniseries that are horror or dramas or a lot of these things but science fiction still feels like it's left to the wayside 
So if you did this remake, and then we're going to ask Ashley what her overall thoughts are, but if we did this remake, would you want them to lean, lean into the the psychological thriller, space horror vibes that uh, the ending in hell sort of sets up as an expectation that they didn't fully deliver on? Yes, but at the same time, again, we need to make sure that whatever media we're producing is going to be something that is still sellable to families. So that that comes to a, that comes to a tonal like, how far can we push the edge without going too far? But you know, we just because like again, this this is Disney, right? They made the Black Cauldron where the villain is a demon, but I know, love that movie. So, <laughs> but like. Now they're talking about like remaking Bambi and getting rid of his mom getting shot off screen. Oh my god, that's such a horrible answer. So, yeah, so you know what I mean. So how there is this there is this line you have to dance to figure out. And I feel like we're, as I said, we're getting further away from it. We're getting more to the like children have to be coddled and we can't have darkness because, you know, I don't know. And I think I think that's I think that's bad because again everyone's like, but the world is sucks. But it's also the fact that kids. Kids like being scared. You don't need to traumatize them, but you but that like spike of fear is good and it's exciting. Is a reason we go see horror movies because you're like, yeah, cool, that was fun. So give them some of that. And if you can if you can keep the same weird metaphysical robots in hell nonsense without going too extreme and without sanitizing it, then yeah, I think you can have a really cool ending that's maybe even ambiguous still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was unclear whether the um, the crew lived or died because you know. Well, they're it's, for... Yeah, it's like they go to heaven, almost. Yeah. It it feels like somebody saw two thousand and one and said, you know what, let's do that, but more ethereal. Yeah, and that's one of the things I noticed. I'm like, wait, they're on this ship to do a survival, like essentially as an escape pod, but I don't see anywhere for them to have food. And how are they going to get home? Cause they're going to run out of power. Like I'm going through, I'm like, these guys basically just, you know, took explosion as death to suffocation as death. And then suddenly like they're in hell, but not cause you know, they got the crystals. So I don't know. It was, it was definitely, it definitely left questions at the end. I'm on the fence on whether I like that in a movie. Cause I also kind of like, um, I kind of like it when when they wrap things up in a pretty little bow for me. So, all right, what about you? What was your overall take on this, Ashley? I think it's um, a signature movie proving that Disney can take anything good and ruin it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, because just look what they've done. You know. Ugh. Okay. What do I th I th if I if I were doing it, you can keep you can square the circle on this. I think you can square it because this is basically cosmic horror. You know, the black hole is leading to a hellscape. You know, it doesn't have to be real. Uh, you know, as in a tangible physical place, it just has to be psychologically real. You know, and that perhaps. That's what this black hole is doing, that it is actually a well of evil darkness because it distorts reality and destroys people's uh, minds. So, you know, they go into it and there you go. You end up in hell, fused inside a robot. That's got, and that, that's hell. You know, it's a vent horizon. Yeah, I, and I, I do get this whole thing. Are we making a family movie, a Disney family movie, or are we making a movie that is accessible but isn't necessarily a, a family? It's not sold as a family movie. Um, it's Forbidden Planet. You know, yeah. is Forbidden Planet a family movie? I would think so. Well, in the 50s, I guess, sci-fi movies were all kid movies, but they had undertones to them and themes to them that a normal kid ain't going to be, like, picking up on. Yeah. Yeah. Layers. That, that's what I'm saying, is that that's what Disney needs to get down with. They need to, yeah, we're making a family movie, but it's going to be kind of 
all the real dark stuff will go over the heads of the kids, but the adults will get it, and the adults will enjoy it for that, and the kids will enjoy it for this. That's Personally, right. I would sell the black hole to Blumhouse and have them make a horror movie out of it. <laughs> I don't, because, I, don't I, mean, see, I don't see is. Disney selling anything. No. Uh, well, they've been getting rid of stuff. They're desperate for cash, so maybe. Um, what was your overall thoughts, Nick? Um, it's an enjoyable film. Um, if I'm entertained, I'll I'll say it's good. I'll recommend it to other people. You know, if you got an hour and a half to two hours to, you know, if you're into sci-fi, check it out. And I'll I'll go into and tell them that I could. Have, are you a fan of Event Horizon? Well, yeah. And I'm like, it's got themes, you know, akin to that. You know, it's got themes. If you've ever seen The Forbidden Planet, it's got themes akin to that. So if you enjoyed those movies, it's I would say it's an amalgamation of those, you know, past and future from when this movie was made. Um, I like Matt Pennings. Matt Paintings. Um, this is t I'll, I'll tell him, like, hey, man, everything's center framed. It's going to be boring because of how it's framed. But it's an overall entertaining movie. There's a little bit of intrigue in there. I love Ernest Borgnine. So for me, I'm, I'm definitely going to pitch that. The robots are, are funny and entertaining and provide not only character or a comic relief, but um, they drag kicking and screaming the plot forward. Um, the villains are kind of meh. You know, they're mid, but uh, no, it's an overall entertaining movie. And if you've got two hours to kill, by all means, check it out, man. You might be surprised. You might find something that you like about it that most of us don't. You know, and I think that's probably one of the best things about cinematic works or even literary works. You know, yeah, the individual reader or viewer is probably going to find stuff in there that you might have missed. You can definitely overall, do worse than the black hole. Yeah. That's, overall, I, I love the movie. That. You can do worse than the black hole. And I have a list of those, too. <laughs> Overall, I like the movie. It didn't have the watch rewatchability that like the Forbidden Planet did. Um, I think some of that with the Forbidden Planet is because you could see where it was the origin for a lot of what followed, whereas this doesn't have that. But you can you can definitely see the influences of the contemporaries for this. Um, but it didn't have like as much of the groundbreaking nature, uh, so it didn't add layers. Um, some of the cinematography choices made me a little dizzy the flashing lights so i wasn't a huge fan um it definitely had some of that same shaky camera vibe that you saw in the blair witch project that i hated um it was cool I, to see their envisioning the envisioning of the spaceships um i really liked that i mean i like all all of that kind of stuff i like seeing some of the art from that era where they were so hopeful that we were just going to have these space colonies and you know now 50 years later we don't even have flying cars yeah. Um, I don't have a bathroom to use anymore. So, um, I, I don't know. I don't know that I'd be watching this a lot. I could see watching it again, but I wouldn't go out of my way to do it. Like if someone else said, "Hey, let's watch this," sure. But I'm not gonna be like, "Oh, let's you know, let's be the one to volunteer watching it." Nah, probably not. If I was doing a star system, I'd probably give it four out of five. There was a lot of untapped potential though that that just left me wanting. I just wanted to sit in that writer's room and I'm like, have you considered, I don't know, insert everything we talked about. Um, and there are a lot of people that did a lot of really good reviews on it. Um, so you can Google that. Um, and Nick is hiding his face because he's blushing. Um, but yeah, so overall, I, I think it had room. Uh, you know what would help though, Stabby? Are you ready for this? Some coffee brand coffee would probably help you perk right up. So, yeah, my cup's um, empty. I know we've got to fix that. So, uh, if you click the link in the show notes with our affiliate uh, partner, Coffee Brand Coffee, and use the code Podcast Grunts, you will get five or ten, depending on like it fluctuates how much percentage off they give you. But uh, and we get a little bit of a kickback to uh, keep the lights on. So, if you like coffee and you like us, use the link, use our code. Either one will work. And, uh, and buy some good stuff. And it's made in America, for those of you that care about that. It is actually produced by the Coffee Brand Coffee Company in Arizona. It is not uh, what we call drop shipped, which means one company's making a bunch and three billion different companies slap a label on it, like some of these other um, coffee ventures are doing these days. So there's a lot of creativity. He definitely likes fruits in his coffee because he's got the strawberries and cream and the blueberries. But uh, it's coffee, so, you know, it's good. And I'm here for it. They have bourbon flavored too. Just my favorite. 
but they didn't put real bourbon in it. So, I mean, I'm just saying there's room for improvement that's with coffee brand coffee, too. That's up to the drinker. That's up to the drinker. It's BYOB. Uh, I do not know if they ship internationally yet, but uh, we will look into that. I know they were talking about it, so we will see. Uh, and I will ask for our international listeners if that's something they're interested in. Um, yeah, because although that probably gets really expensive if you're shipping international. Come on, audience, buy it. We need our bag so we can keep the show going. Yeah, and if nothing else, just keep Stabby awake. All right. So with that being said, we're going to allow our guests to tell us first what they're writing now and then how we can find them. So, uh, Ashley, what are you writing right now? I'm currently in editing hell, uh, working on a, a cosmic horror story called The Bureau, which is retro 1980s, think MI5 versus Cthulhu. There you go. Okay. I like that. And you can find me, it, all my things will be in the links, won't they, in this podcast? Absolutely. And if you search my name, I, I will come up fairly near the top of any lucky for you yeah <laughs> sucks Ooh, to be just, you though <laughs> you just rub that in a little bit deeper poured some salt on it for good measure she's like i'll show you you silly yank <laughs> <laughs> all right mike what are you writing right now and um then tell us how we can find you well i was in editing hell but i managed to claw my way out yeah pegasus child done yes pegasus child um which is, I guess the easiest way to describe it is kind of a coming of age dystopian cyberpunk, kind of. Um, yeah, dealing with a with an orphan girl who kind of gets wrapped up in a in a revolution that she doesn't really understand. Um, but uh, yeah, you can you can find me on uh, under uh, the Dawnward Universe, and that's going to be on all the the Instagrams and the Facebooks and. And all that other fancy nonsense and and dawnwarduniverse.com um but uh, yeah and the links will be, be down below but, uh, and um just for the record i have read the pegasus child i did some of his beta reading and there is definitely not mary sue territory so uh maybe disney should call you when they want to write some plots you and ashley can just like get that perfect blend of symmetry and, and give them better ideas there we go. Well, I mean, I don't see it ever happening, but, you know, weirder things have happened. I mean, you could also win the lottery. Stuff happens, people. Hold on, I, I got to put my laptop it down. Didn't so I, work. <laughs> I, tried, I tried it once. I'm done. Never again. So just for a fun question to, uh, to end with, uh, since we've, we've gone all over the place with IPs, uh, if you could write in your any property that's your sort of dream franchise, if you, if you got invited to write a story – uh, in that universe, what would you pick, Ashley? Aliens. We get that a lot, actually. Yeah, okay. We are actually working on an episode with for Alien versus Predator as one of our discussion panels. We will have to uh, incorporate you into that. Uh, she's she's giddy over here, people. For the, you listening in podcast land, she's bouncing with joy. Uh, you made her unlike our review of this uh, this movie, which wasn't as joyful. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, what uh, what IP would you work in if you could? That's tough because um, I will say Aliens is actually like my favorite movie of all time. Um, so that's t I love Xenomorphs so much. I might am actually trying to convince my wife to let our daughter dress as a Xenomorph for Halloween. But um, it might it might be Firefly. Okay, it might be. I've always thought it'd be interesting to kind of see that universe explored from multiple angles. Um, I think the easy answer would be like something like Star Wars, which would still be rad. But I think that that would be one of those that's like the potential is there, and it would be such an adventure to do that. I would, pro I might pick that. If that's the case, I want to know the story behind um, the Preacher Man. Shepherd Book, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I also want the uh, I, the Brown Coat War. I have questions about the Brown Coats War too. Oh my God, I've told you this a million times. Shepherd Book was an operator. He was an operative for the Alliance. That's the Still story. More Digging that. <laughs> okay. Stabby, I know you are not a um, creative type. You just, you know, manage the company <laughs> in the background. Sure. But you have ideas and you read a lot. So if you could decide to write your first ever novel, what IP would you want to play with? Do, 
do, do, do, do. Don't judge me. There's so many things that you could just have so much fun with. I mean, I know it's clearly Dino Riders. It's all right. You can just you can just say that. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I was like, I was a little disappointed in the last Jurassic Park movie when they had the old cast meet the new cast, and I think that could have been so much better done. That, that was a drunk fanfic, and I, I was I, like, about ninety percent <laughs> of that movie was just pointless. Shit. Do you remember this thing and that thing? And oh, look at this thing. But better yeah. graphics. <laughs> and that's all I could think is if you're going to bring those two sets of people together, we could have done it in such a better way. I'm just saying the Babysitter's Club meets Jurassic Park. All the girls will love it. It'll be beautiful. Ooh. Oh, and by the way, Coffee Brand Coffee does ship internationally, just not all of their products can be shipped internationally. But I just checked the five-pound um, bag of Spice Jack-O-Lantern um, coffee, and that does ship to the UK. So Outstanding. All right. So uh, Jurassic Park fixing the last movie. I'm, I'm down for that. I'm always about the dinosaurs. So uh, what about you, Nick? What IP? Uh, I would like to dive into an old sci-fi show, and it's not really all that old, I guess, but uh, Space Above and Beyond. Wow. Okay. Ooh, okay. But instead okay. of Marines, I'm a ranger, and I would do it from like a, another unit's aspect that's more like the rangers. Is that the one with Arlie Emery as a guest spot as a drill sergeant? Yeah, you had tanks, which were your like uh, artificially grown humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that... They were infantry and pilots and all kind. Of, like it was weird, but it was awesome. I loved that show so much. Either they that, all or, things, yeah. Um, if I couldn't do that, Lost in Space. Oh, okay, okay. Did you like the uh, the reboot where uh, the was it Netflix did? Uh, yeah, that that was very entertaining. Um, it did kind of touch on some ideas that I had about like a failing marriage while you're out in outer space, you know. Um, yeah. I liked. I thought, yeah. That's I, another I, example of representation done right. They made um, the older sister African American, but then they explained it in a way that's like, oh, okay, I'll buy it because I don't mind changes if you just make it fit the overall lore, like that she right. had been married before. It it, it made, made it. Yeah. Uh, an example of how to do it wrong would be like the um, be, uh, Charmed reboot, where it's ethnically diverse in a way that didn't make sense because the whole premise of the series was they're all they're sisters. Sisters, yeah. And it's kind of hard to be sisters if they're, you know, nothing is related about them. Um, they have different dads. I watched the whole thing. They have. They all have the same mom. They have different dads. That's that mom got around. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Then, um, they Mama was a rolling left, stone, apparently. Well, they <laughs> left us on a they left us on a cliffhanger at the very end because when they kind of time travel to get out of their universe because their universe Gosh, spoilers. Is collapsing. <laughs> it's been well, out for years. Well, if you haven't watched it, it's not my fault. But they they wind up on the Hollowell sisters um doorstep. And then that's just where it ends. And nothing. And then it got canceled. Should have. <laughs> All right, so um, you would do Lost in Space. I, I like that. Would you focus on the, the Robinson family, or would you get, like, the reboot where they had a bunch of families and they're running? Would you focus on one of the other well, families? You, you, you don't mess with tradition. As my boys in Letter Kenny would say, you don't mess with tradition. So I would keep it focused on the Robinsons. Um, I think I would time warp it a little bit. I'd do a little time jump um, where... You know, um, you know the parents are grandparents, and you know they've they've settled on. They finally found the planet they want to settle on, and they've they've built upon that. I would like to almost like a Star Trek TNG type deal. Um, okay. I don't know. I don't know if there's any interest in that. And I'm not much of a writer. I draw shit. So, but I might just do like a comic of my own, and I don't know. Maybe so, just show it to some people, and maybe they'll like it. And they'll give me a buttload of money. That's the dream. That's the dream. I, I do think there's room in a lot of the older properties that could just be explored. It's a good thing to leave people wanting more, but sometimes when they want more, you can give them more and still take more of their money and make them happy. Um, 
you don't want to push it till it feels like a money grab. But I mean, some of these properties they just left, they left a lot. Like you could do there. a new series of Land of the Lost, and that would be very entertaining. Yes, I could see that. And get dinosaurs. So always a plus. I don't know if I was gonna do it. I always wanted more of Stargate. I love that franchise. I, I'm one of the few 12 people. We have a support group that likes Stargate Universe. I, I thought I it was well more of Stargate fun. can you go into? Atlantis, SG1. However many combinations there are on the Stargate. There's pl and and we never got an answer to the background to the background story of what the um the Stargate universe, the ship was was doing because it was one of the original ships. We know don't know what the sound is. We don't know what happened to everybody after Eli put them to sleep at the end of the Stargate when they ended it and just left us hanging. Uh, we do know that they gave us a graphic novel, which was supposed to tie it all up for us because that's what they sold it. So I spent forty dollars when it first came out, and I didn't get an ending. I got another freaking cliffhanger. Not that I'm still bitter. Sometimes you gotta um, spend for this I don't know. Yeah, no, I guess. Uh, the art was glorious. I mean, there's just, I want the end of the Stargate Universe tale. It asked a lot of questions. I like that it was a little bit grittier. Um, I, I, there's definitely room to explore the, uh, although I don't know, may, I don't know if it's have to be Stargate or if it's just, I like the idea of the portals. You know, it'd be interesting a Stargate series, uh, call, you call it Stargate Origins, but it's from like the maker's point of view. Why Atlanteans. Is that what it is? Is that well, actually, no, the Atlanteans found it too, I think. But anyway, I know we promised Ortiz would be in and out in under a half hour in Rhett too, and he's got kids that like eating and stuff, so we probably should should bring this home. And I will tell you, uh, all of their links will be in the show notes. You should tell us in the comment section what you would like to uh, see more of, what franchise property uh, you would like more of. But uh, speaking of reviews and telling us what you think, before I let you go, please remember to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. So do your part, people. Speaking of doing your part, you can find us to communicate with us all of these glorious ideas on our link tree, which is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E, link tree slash Blasters and Blades podcast. Again, link tree slash Blasters and Blades podcast, where we link to all the things, the bit shoot, the rumbles, the Twitters, the Facebook groups. You can email us at Blasters and Blades podcast at gmail.com for serious inquiries only. If you want to send hate mail, Madam Stabby is linked in the show notes. Under our link tree, you can get her on the Instagrams and the Twitters and send all the hate. She loves it. She will mock you relentlessly and then make you cry. But you like it. That's what you're here for. Uh, you could support the show over on our website at anchor.fm slash blasters tack and tack blades. Again, anchor.fm slash blasters dash and dash blades. Where for as little as 99 cents a month, you can help keep the lights on. Or you could support the show more directly over at buymeacoffee.com slash author Jared Hanley. Again buymeacoffee.com slash author Jared Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section that is for the podcast. And I promise I will buy some of that glorious coffee brand coffee and keep my co-host do indubitably caffeinated. Yeah, that sounded cooler in my head. I'll do better next time, I promise. Uh, and with that being said, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For my crazy co-host, I am Jared Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. Nick, I want to see some of those agitator spirit hands. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, we got the spirit hands, people. You know it's over. And that's a wrap. 